and you can see if you plot the arrivals just before a seminar starts, you will see an accumulation point. So that's a definition of limb soup. <laughs> right, right. Uh, it did. It did go up. Wow. Uh, yeah. So from now on, the the session is recorded. Um, so, Bastien, is it? Uh, Okay, to start now, or are there still technical reasons to wait? I think it's okay. So I will also also start a, a recording on the on on my laptop in order to have a, a backup uh, video in case something goes wrong with the live. Uh, so yeah, you, usually it works uh, with a little bit of a delay. Just I, I'm seeing that we are uh, getting more and more numerous. So well. If someone cannot uh, enter the room, uh, please be reminded that there is a, um, a, a live on YouTube as well. So there is like, a, I think, a 20 seconds delay between the, the, the live version on Zoom and the version on, on, on YouTube. But uh, you will see everything that way. Great. Um, OK, so since uh, it's uh, 2 PM. Okay, recording in progress, good. Um, so since it's uh, 2 p.m. Uh, UTC, uh, I guess uh, we should start. So hello everyone, uh, welcome or welcome back to the One World uh, Probability Seminar. Um, so good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. And um, so it's a pleasure to, to resume uh, now. So the first, uh, the, the first session of uh, the semester will be uh, given by Percy Diaconis and uh, Laurent Miclot. And um, on the right away, we will uh, start with the talk of uh, Percy Diaconis from uh, Stanford University, who will uh, talk to us about a very uh, fascinating object, namely uh, the random graph. So I let you speak. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank, thank you, and, and good morning from California. Uh, hello to many, many friends, an amazing collection of, of people. Uh, I'd like to, well, okay. Uh, and uh, oh, uh, this is a, a project I entered for reasons that will come in the beginning, but let me let me just um, let me just start with a, a little a little probability. Uh, uh, ho hopefully you can see. Um, uh, so for, this is joint work with uh, Sharif Chatterjee and, and Laurent Miklo. Um, and to start with a simple question, um, everybody I know knows what, a, what an erdos renyi random graph is. You have n points, and for each pair of points, you flip a fair coin. These are gn half. And, um, and so pick an erdos renyi random graph, call it gamma 1, and Pick another one independently, call it gamma two. What's the chance that they're this isomorphic? Isomorphic means there's a one-to-one -one mapping from the vertex set of one into the vertex set of the other, which takes edges to edges. So what's the chance they're the same graphs? And of course that's small, uh, intuitively it's small. And if you ask how small, well, it's, it's small. That is um, whatever the first graph is, the chance that the second graph matches it, it's a random graph. So the chance of any random graph is one over two to the n choose two. And uh, then there are most n, n factorial ways of re relabeling the vertices. So the chance that they match is, is at most n factorial over two to the n choose two. And just to remind you how small that is, when n is 100, that's 10 to the minus 1300. So it's small, it doesn't happen, right? And now, you know, let, let n be infinity and do the same thing. Pick an erdos renyi graph. There's nothing wrong with that. Infinitely many vertices. Connect them all by fair coin flips. And the, the strange first fact is that with probability one, those two graphs are isomorphic. And so I want to begin by convincing you of, of that. Or reminding you if you've seen it um, before, and this argument recurs um, throughout. Um, so it's worth understanding. It's a um, so here's a property that a graph might or might not have. Um, suppose you take um, x1 up to xn, a set of vertices in the graph, distinct, and a, a, another set of m vertices, y1 up to ym, all distinct. 
It might or might not be true that for every choice of x's and y's, there's another vertex z such that z is adjacent to all of the x's and z is not adjacent to any of the y's. Okay, that, that's this picture. You might or might not be true. There, there are um, two facts. Um, the first fact is that a random G infinity graph has this property, which I'll be calling star, almost surely. And the argument is easy. Fix some X's and Y's. Um, the chance that star fails for in other points, there are infinitely many points, the chance that star fails for Z1, Z2, up to Zn, well, it's, you know, the, it has to, it has to be incorrectly assigned uh, um, to each, each of the n plus m vertices. So the chance that fails is one minus that, but raised to the nth power, well, then let n go to infinity. You've got a lot of possible choices. So the chance that star fails um, for, for a fixed set of x's and y's is zero, and there are only countably many x's and y's. So um, uh, the chance that uh, that star holds for an ordish renyi graph is one. Um, and the second fact um, is uh, if, uh, so if I take two independent ones, they both satisfy star, uh, but if you have any two graphs, which both have property star, then they're isomorphic. And we'll just build the isomorphism one step at a time. Take some point in the first graph and map it to any other point in the second graph. And now take another point in the first graph. If it's adjacent to the, the first point, um, find a point which is adjacent to the, the map point and, and connect it. If it's not adjacent, find a point here which is not adjacent. But let's do that a little more carefully. Um, uh, so we'll enumerate the vertices to avoid axiom of choice. And um, suppose I built up this isomorphism up to step, step n. So I have n points in the first graph and they're mapped to n points in the second graph, such that the, 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 the graph, the induced graph by, of the first n points is isomorphic to the induced graph of the, um, uh, of the map points. Now, if n is even, let find the point in the first graph, um, uh, which is not in the which hasn't been mapped, not in the domain of the mapping, and extend f one step to this new point in the following way. Let u be the neighbors of the the new point among the old ones, and let v be their complement among the old ones, the ones which are adjacent to the new point, and the ones which aren't, um, a potential image of the new point um, has to be connected to the images of the, uh, to the images in V and not connected to the images of the points in U, but there is such a point because gamma two satisfies star. So just extend it. So that's, now I want my mapping to be on to. So I, I, at the odd times, um, suppose we've, we've constructed the map up to now, take a point which isn't in the range of the map and just do the same thing. You know, just it's connected to some of these, it's not connected to some of those. And there is a point back here which maps correctly. So um, uh, it, 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 it's, it's easy, it's this back and, classical back and forth argument. So therefore um, there is this thing we may talk about the random graph and, and logicians call it R, the Ratto graph um, after Richard Ratto. And it, it's sort of an amazing thing. And here are some properties that it has. Um, first of all, it's robust. That is, if I have a random, if I have R, any, any version of it, I can uh, delete any number of vertices and um, uh, delete or add any finite number of edges. And it's still isomorphic uh, because you can just check property star for it. If I delete some vertices, and if I have two sets of vertices that are, that are left, well, there's still, there's, there's still something adjacent to the first set and not to the second. Um, it's characterized by this funny pigeonhole principle. If you divide the vertex set into K disjoint subsets, uh, then in one of the boxes, 
um, has a full copy of R, a graph which is isomorphic to R. Um, you can argue that from, from, from property star. Um, it's universal. Um, it contains any, any uh, finite or countable graph as an induced subgraph. So it contains an infinite empty graph. Um, it contains you know, an infinite complete graph. Uh, it contains all, all graphs. And that's easy to argue. You don't have to go back and forth um, just uh, and just go forth. Um, that is, suppose I have some other graph and I want to find it in R. Well, just take the first vertex and map it someplace and then take the second vertex. And if that's connected to the first, find something that's connected to the first and just keep going. And you can, you can build an isomorphic copy, an exact isomorphic copy. Um, the graph is what logicians call homogeneous, um, which means that um, if, if you have any identification, um, uh, if you have two, um, let's say just, if you have any mapping of, of, a, of a subset into itself, which is isomorphic, like if you have a triangle and you map it to another triangle, um, you can extend that to an isomorphism of the full graph. Um, the, I, the, it has in really a lot of symmetry. It's two to the aleph naught, the size of the symmetry group. And it's a simple group. Um, just for what's coming, um, the, this graph uh, it has diameter two, because given any two points, I can certainly find another point, which is adjacent to both of them. And each vertex is connected to about half the others. So it's very, very interconnected graph. Um, it has other properties which are coming. Um, uh, I built it from by probability, but there are many, many other constructions um, and it'll be useful to have uh, a, a few of them. Uh, Rado's construction, which is not a random construction, is the following. Take the integers, 0, 1, 2, etc., and pick a pair of integers, i and j, and say i is less than j. And if the ith binary digit, if the ith bit of j is a 1, you put an edge from i to j. And if the ith bit of j is a 0, you don't, and they're undirected edges. So let's try to look at that for a second. Um, so the bits are labeled from left to right. The, the first bit is the zeroth bit. That's the convention I'm gonna use. So zero, the number zero in the integers is, connect, or is connected to all the odd numbers, all the numbers that have a, a one in the zeroth position that begin with one. Um, one is connected to numbers with one in the, the first position, and those are numbers which are two or three mod four, and of course one is also connected to zero. So first of all, that's a very concrete construction, and um, and it, it it easily satisfies star. If I have some x's and some y's, uh, then uh, then you know if if x's are one five seventeen, I I um, there are some integers. I, I put a one in position one, five, and 17 in an infinite binary tuple. And I put zeros in the positions of the y's and then I do anything else. And so that's a point which is connected to all the first and all the second. So, so this model of the radiograph um, uh, is, is another radiograph. Um, you can build it in, um, in a number, th in number theoretic language. If you take the vertex set to be the primes, which are one mod four, and if you connect two primes, if the Legendre symbol uh, P mod Q is one, that's the same graph and you need you know, the Chinese remainder theorem and some e easy elementary number theory to do it. I first ran into it um, in, um, in work I was doing in group theory. Um, um, many of you may know, but here it is. Uh, there's something called the Heisenberg group. And for the moment, um, uh, let's call it the set of triples X, Y, Z. Uh, this is the Heisenberg group with entries mod P. It could be in any ring, but I'm going to do it with entries mod p. P is going to be a prime, um, and x is a is a is a a, a k tuple uh, uh, points in in mod p, and y is a k tuple of points mod p, and z is just a point mod p. 
Um, so it's triples X, Y, Z with that structure. And uh, if you like, you can put them in the top row in the last column of a, of a, of a, in, of a K by K plus one by K plus one matrix with ones on the diagonal zero every place else. That's another model for it. And the product is X, Y, Z times X prime, Y prime, Z prime is, you, know, you add the first two coordinates, you add the second two coordinates, you add the third two coordinates, but then you put this thing in X times Y prime. And that's a group, that's the Heisenberg group and its center is zero, zero, Z. And it's a pretty famous group. Um, well, and I'll also be doing it when K is infinity. So this, as long as, as long as the infinite tuples are, are finite past some point, this dot product, this is the usual dot product between two vectors, that makes perfect sense. And, and that would be H infinity P. You can form a graph with vertices, the non-central elements of a um, Heisenberg group and connect to if they commute. So the commuting graph of the, of the group. And, um, we were studying, uh, we were trying to show that describing the character theory of the, of the uni upper triangular group is an impossible problem. And uh, along the way we started here and we were trying to show it was impossible by showing that that problem con contained the Rado graph. And of course, if, if, if something contains the random graph, well, you can't describe it, you know, in, in English somehow. Anyway, anyway, the, it's a little theorem that uh, the H infinity P contains uh, the Rado graph as an induced subgraph, but as a large induced subgraph. And um, I'll give a reference to that. So, but there are many, many instances, in fact, <laughs> to logicians, um, this is a very basic object. After all, a graph is simply a, 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 a language, a model with, with, with one relation. And, and so studying models with one relation is, is an absolutely basic thing. For a logician, the radograph, they say the radograph is as basic an object as the rational numbers. <laughs> the rational numbers is the, the limit of the, um, of the, of the, uh, uh, of the um, uh, linearly ordered finite sets and the uh, Rado graph is the limit of all finite graphs. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an object that that's, has a life of its own. Um, uh, it, it, one more thing, it, there's a zero one law, a first order property that is something which can be written with exists and they're for every and not, and you can iterate that finitely often. Uh, with, with elements, a first order property holds in almost all finite graphs or with probability one and in, in a, with probability tending to one in a large Erdős Renyi graph, if and only if it holds in, um, uh, if the, the property holds in the Rado graph. Um, so it, 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 it incorporates, it captures the first order, um, uh, the first order um, properties of of graph theory in a certain real sense. Um, uh, I'm not doing justice to it and I'm gonna stop <laughs> and, uh, not doing justice to it. But if you want to, if you get nothing out of this talk except this, there's a wonderful article by Peter Cameron called The Random Graph and you should look at it. It's on the archive and it's just, just wonderful. Um, and it, there's many, many things I'm not telling you about. Okay, now I'm a probabilist and um, uh, uh, a natural way to understand anything for me is to make a random walk on it. Um, and uh, then that forces you to ask our kinds of questions and maybe try to understand them. So I wanna, I wanna make a random walk on the Rado graph just as a way of, of touching it as a probabilist. So pick a probability distribution on whatever vertex set you're working in. I'll think of it as the integers. And so I've got, you know, Q of X is bigger than zero and some, it's strictly positive every place, sums to one. And here's my random walk. I'm at a vertex V in my, in my graph. And I look at all the neighbors of me and I pick one of them with probability proportional to Q. I can't think of anything simpler to do. Uh, and um, uh, that gets you a way of marching around in the graph. And, and uh, um, 
So let's write that down. The transition probability, uh, the chance of going from V to V prime is, well, you have to pick V prime. And then this is the normalizing um, constant, the, the, the mass of all the neighbors of where you started. Okay, and it's zero, of course, if V and V prime aren't connected. Um, so that's a Markov chain. And what did it do? It's an infinite graph, does it? You know, it's a little bit non-standard. It's not locally finite, tough. It's just simple as it can be, there it is. Um, it is interesting, I found it surprising that um, this is a reversible Markov chain um, and there has a stationary distribution. And here's the stationary distribution. The stationary di distribution at a point V is the mass at V, Q of V, times the mass of the neighborhood of V divided by a norm, some fixed normalizing constant. And why is it? Let's just verify that this is a, is a this, this satisfies the detailed balance. That is pi x k x y. Well, that's pi of x. Yeah, that's the stationary distribution of x. That's the chance of going from x to y if it's not zero. And these, the, these guys cancel. So that's q of x, q of y. And that's symmetric. So it's pi y, k y x. So by elementary probability, if you wander around with this Markov chain for any q, um, you converge to the stationary distribution. And then if you're me, and even some of you, um, it's natural to ask, all right, how long does it take to um, get random? What's the rate of convergence of this random walk to the stationary distribution? And for that, we'll have to you know, do Cheeger or paths or who knows, we'll, you'll see. And uh, we'll have to understand some of the structure of the graph. So this is, this was a, a way to trick myself into trying to think about the radiograph. Now, intuitively, it, it's gonna converge fast because the, the diameter is two. So wherever you are, you can get you know, back to zero uh, in two steps. And the, the, the stationary distribution is concentrated near zero. And you know, everything's connected to half of the other vertices. And even I thought for a while that the rate of convergence would be bounded. That is wherever you are, you know, five steps will, will suffice. Um, that's not true. Um, and um, this is our first look at how probability makes you touch the Radho graph. Um, so I'll work in this Boolean model. Um, and remember that is that I is connected to J if and only if the ith binary digit of J is a one, okay? And I, I'll, I, I took just the simplest probability distribution, again, not to fuss with that. You can, we can fuss with that and we will. Uh, as we go on, but let's just take the geometric distribution on the vertex set. Um, so, okay. So the pi of zero, the chance of zero, um, well, it's the, the, the mass at zero times the mass of the neighborhood at zero. The mass of the neighborhood of zero are all the odd numbers and the odd numbers have mass a third under the geometric distribution. And then there's a normalizing constant, of course, pi of zero is less than one. So the normalizing constant is no trouble. Um, it's just bounded between one and, and, a, and six and okay. I need this funny notation. I'm always making front, fun of my combinatorial friends for their towers of two. Well, here they come for us for a second. Um, set two round brackets K, I'll just call it two to the K, two to the two to the two to the two where there are K twos on the page. So for example, two to the zero is just, well, one and uh, two to the one is two, two to the two is two to the two, which is four. Two cubed is two to the two to the two, which is 16. And up they go and they go very fast uh, as you'll be reminded. I'm gonna start the chain out at two to the K. That's, I can start it where I want for a lower bound. Now, this is, you have to, okay, there it is. Now I know this connectivity. The only smaller J that's connected to two to the K is two to the K minus one. So that, for example, uh, 16 um, has a one in position zero, one, two, three, four. And so it's connected to four and it's not connected to anything el else. So that's 
easy, but you have to re remember the definitions. Uh, the only smaller j connected to two to the k is two to the k minus one. The, the j's that are connected to two to the k that are larger um, are super exponentially bigger because uh, they, they have to have a one in the, in the two to the k position. So they're at least, you know, they're huge numbers. Uh, and uh, so, of course, they have ex super exponentially small probability. So the chain started at two to the k with probability approaching one goes to two to the k minus one. And then it goes to two to the k minus two, et cetera. So it slowly marches down to um, down to where it's small, and then it can bobble around a little bit. So that's the idea. And um, when you put put the calculations in, um, if you start at two to the k, the chance that after l steps you're at two to the k minus l. Is, is close to one, uh, you can get this kind of bound. And from that, it's easy by just total variation is the soup overall subsets, just take the one point set to zero. What's the chance that the chain started at two to the K is at zero um, and, uh, and that's, that's bigger than, than, than this. So Takas, I told you uh, we were gonna have uh, log star. Uh, it takes at least log star uh, uh, of the starting state for certain starting states to converge. And I remind you, in case it's not your friend, log star is how many times you have to apply log in order to get down to something, you know, negative or, or so, for example, uh, if if I is 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 between six six five three five six and two to the six five three five six log star is five, so it grows very very slowly. <laughs> okay, but it's not bounded. Okay, um, uh, yeah, I, I'm not gonna. I don't want to say about. Well, I'm gonna make a finite. Um, okay, so. Uh, um, if you want to hear what the right answer is, you'll have to wait for the second part of this talk. Laurent Miklo is going to tell you what we learned. Um, uh, okay. So I've been off in infinity, and even the existence of the radiograph makes me a little seasick. And it's natural to ask, is there a finite version of some of the story I just told you or... or you know, there's a real discontinuity. This radiograph is the limit in the sense that logicians call the Fresse limit, um, uh, but there's a natural kind of inductive limit uh, uh, for, for models, and, and the radiograph is the limit of all finite graphs. And, um, uh, and you know, the limit is supposed to tell you about finite things, but here's a wild discontinuity, right? Finite things, the chance the two graphs are isomorphic is zero. The radiograph there it's one. So uh, that stinks. <laughs> so that's not a very good limiting object. So I, I tried to find properties of the radiograph, what properties, how properties of the radiograph translated into things about finite graphs. And that's a little bit off to the side, but the math is interesting. And so, it, and I was led to it from the story I just told you. So let me tell you a few sentences. Um, about it. Um, so now all graphs are finite. And um, uh, so suppose I pick two independent erdos renyi graphs with n and a half. What's the size of the largest induced isomorphic subgraph? So that means I have to find a set of vertices here, a set of vertices here, and a one-to-one -one mapping, which takes you know edges to edges and non-edges to non-edges. So they're isomorphic as these two. If you take all the edges from here and all the edges from here, the two graphs are the same. Um, well, um, uh, it's not very big, but and the answer is it's about four log n, and it's very very concentrated. And, and I want to state that as a as a as a careful theorem. Um, so this is a theorem uh, in, from work with um, Shorov Chatterjee, uh, and here it goes. Um, so suppose I have two independent erdos renyi graphs, and let L n be the size of the largest induced 
subgraph, isomorphic subgraph in the two graphs. Then with probability tending to one, when n is large, ln is one of two values. ln is either xn minus epsilon or xn plus epsilon with probability one, where xn is four log to the base two of n minus two log, log two minus some other constant. And epsilon is going to zero, it's, um, it's uh, four over square root of log n. Um, so just to help you look at that, it's a lot of symbols. Um, if n is bigger than two, epsilon's less than a half. So these two numbers differ by at most one. Um, so usually the size of the largest induced subgraph is, is within one of each other. And mostly it's the same number, it's a fixed number. Um, uh, when n is large, because this is tending to zero, but infinitely often there'll be two numbers. Um, and uh, the asymptotics, these asymptotics kick in quite rap rapidly. It's a sharp p complete problem to compute the largest induced isomorphic subgraph, uh, but some good people actually in Glasgow um, uh, got interested and they could do some small examples. When n is 31, um, my xn here is about 15, epsilon is about 0.2. So the floor of, uh, well, the, 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 the theorem says ln is either 13 or 14, and the a, a simulation gave that it's 14. So they did a bunch of simulations and these asymptotics are, are surprisingly good. And I find it, it heartening that, um, uh, that any expression with log log in it has anything to do with the number 31. I mean, these approximations work for small n's and they do, I'm not telling you all the data. That's nice, you know, every once in a while, the asymptotics are good for something. Um, uh, okay, so here's a, a bit of a story. Um, I can show you this. Um, so this theorem, this question is sufficiently close to the surface pick two order Schrenry graphs at random, what's the largest isomorphic subgraph? I was sure somebody knew. So I asked my friends in higher places, Svante Janssen, Benny Sudikoff, um, my colleague Jacob Fox, and um, they all said, hey, that's funny, we don't know that. Um, that's okay. Um, but they said, but I heard a related question. And Svanta sent me to my colleague, Don Knuth, and this is a wonderful thing, and a lot of things are open. It's an amazing picture I'm about to show you, so let me try to explain it. Um, uh, so uh, here's the related question. Um, uh, suppose I have two different ends, little n and big n. How should they be related so that if I pick a little gamma one in, in g n a half, I'd call that the target graph, that you can find a copy of it as an induced subgraph in G in capital a half. And the answer, as I'll explain in a second, is, 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 is about to, to log in. And um, the, this picture and interest in this question, you know, to me, it seems like some funny graph theory question, but it turns out to be a fairly central question in a world that's foreign to me. It's the world of constraint satisfaction, KSAT and that sort of thing. Um, and um, this picture is from a paper, when subgraph isomorphism is really hard and why it matters for graph databases. Um, nobody needs to be told that there's a huge amount of face recognition, for example. What that amounts to as a math problem is you have a graph, the, the pixels in somebody's face and the adjacencies are if they're close together, and you have another graph, a crowd scene, and you want to find if this graph occurs in this crowd scene. But cleaned up, it becomes exactly this problem. You have a target graph and you have a host graph, and you want to know does the target graph appear as an induced subgraph of the host graph? And that comes up in, in document processing and in, in all kinds of problems. And there's big groups of computer scientists that have big algorithms. They're sharp P complete problems, but they do approximations to try to solve this problem. They test and compare their, their programs out and there are contests. And 
the test problems that they use, they often take a big graph and then they'll just take a little subgraph of it and then give it to the program and see, can it tell that this little subgraph is in there? This group, the Glasgow group, um, said, that's not a very good test problem. Here's a good test problem. Take a, a random graph, an erdos renyi random graph, and take another one, a big one, and, and see if the little graph is in the big graph and see how long your program takes to do it. As part of their work, they produce this picture. So let me try to explain this picture. Each of these squares represents that task where the big graph has 150 vertices and the little graph has 10, 14, 15, et cetera, vertices. The axes are labeled by P and P1 and P2. Um, uh, so the, the big graph is, is, um, has P2 and the little graph has P1. And so they're erdos renyi graphs with P1 and P2. Uh, and then this is, this is an experiment um, and green means um, they, you could find it. Uh, and red means you couldn't, and there's a actually, okay, there's a scale. But um, so when the big graph had 150 and the little graph had 10, you could find it a lot. It depends on P1 and P2, but you could find it a lot. Um, when the, the little graph had 14, well, you could kind of find it a lot. The little graph had 15. When P is close to a half, you could still find it, and there was a break at 16. So these are striking pictures and you know they just, and Don Knuth showed me these pictures and said, can you explain those pictures? Well, the theorem I'm about to tell you about is just looking at the middle, just looking when P1 is equal to P2 is equal to a half, and I leave to you all the other values of P1, P2. No, I leave it to me too. They're open. Uh, I, I'd love to explain these curves, and their paper has many other related questions. So that's a motivation. Anyway, here's the theorem that Shoroff and I proved. Um, um, I didn't want to do that. Uh, see if I can get rid of it. Um, um, so uh, fix a little n and a capital N. Let P little n capital N be the probability that um, if gamma one is a erdos renyi graph with little n and a half, that the gamma one is contained in a random pick from the erdos renyi model with big N and a half. Um, and that, that's called P little n big N. As, as when N is large, um, what we proved is that, uh, again, P is concentrated at two points in this sense. Um, the, if, if little n is y n minus epsilon, the probability tends to one. If y n is, if, if, if little n is y, y capital N plus epsilon n, the probability tends to zero. And, and y capital N is two log n plus one, and, and epsilon is again, something uh, over square root of log n. So there's, there's a very sharp uh, concentration. Um, and as an example, um, when n is 150, um, uh, this y is around 15 and epsilon is 0.19. And the theorem says that the, the chance that an Erdos Renyi 15 occurs in a Erdos Renyi 150 is one. And the chance that you find the 16 is zero. And that's what happened uh, in the pictures in the pictures above. Um, and I, I'm not, I'm not time and, well, I don't know. Um, uh, the, the proof of both theorems is quite technical. It's the sort of classical old fashioned hammer and tongs graph, random graph theory. And uh, I, I don't, well, I don't, it's not the main focus of this talk. The reason I stuck it in, um, because it is, a, it is a little bit of a non sequitur, is uh, it, it, I'm trying to understand the, the Rado graph. And um, one way of understanding it, if you're a probabilist, is to make a Markov chain on it. And another way is to try to see what features of the, of the Rado graph go down to, to finite graphs. And, and they both led to interesting, in, interesting um, math. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I did, I have it on the, the, the 
I, I, the slides will go out. Our paper with Sharaf is, is on the archive. I don't know, the thing is, I don't know how to tell you how the proof goes in any way that would be comprehensible. Uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's a first and second moment type calculations and uh, I'm gonna, I'll do one. <laughs> okay. Um, so suppose I have two graphs, uh, gamma one and gamma two, and let xij and yij be the indicators of an edge. So they're one or zero. Let script A be the set of ordered n tuples between one and capital N. Um, and for two ordered n tuples, say that they're equivalent if the two graphs are the same. That is uh, all of the, if there's an edge in gamma one, there's an edge in gamma two. And if there's not an edge in gamma one, there's not an edge in gamma two across those two edges. Um, introduce a, a, a random variable W, which is the, the number of pairs uh, A and B, um, which are equivalent. So that's just the natural thing to do. And the, the uh, L of N, uh, the, the, the length of the largest isomorphic subgraph uh, is, is bigger than or equal to N if and only if W is zero. So just to say the zero sort of thing, you can get an upper bound on W by the first moment method. The chance that W is bigger than zero, which is what I had to get my hands on. Well, because of this, this symmetry, you know, you, SN acts on the indices, you can permute everything. So that's uh, equal to the chance that W is bigger than uh, N factorial. And that's less than or equal to the expected value of W over N factorial. The expected value of W, it's not bad. It's, um, it's uh, the, the, you know, it's the size of A squared um, times, uh, two to the minus n choose two. For any a, the chance that the other one matches is, is two to the n choose two. And you can bound the size of a, the number of distinct little sequences of length n by, by capital N. So this is less than or equal to that. And then you choose little n so that this is small. I mean, so, okay, that's, but the lower bound and getting a sharp lower bound use the second moment method and you don't want to see it and I don't want to show it to you. So, uh, uh, um, okay. So going back, um, uh, going back, uh, I'll give a reference to it. Um, what did I do in this talk? Um, I introduced you to the Rado graph, the random graph. Um, uh, I told you a little bit about its properties. It has many others. Uh, it's universal. It contains all other subgraphs, as induced subgraphs. It has a huge symmetry group and it captures the first order theory of, of Erdős Renyi random graphs. Um, I introduced a simple Markov chain on R and showed worst case that it takes log star of n to converge starting from n. And I try to show you how attempts to understand finite analogs of R led to uh, nice math. Um, if you wanted to look more uh, at this, uh, the second part of the talk is a paper on the archive um, with Shorof. Um, the logic motivation, and um, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting story. Um, Marianthi Meliaris is a model theorist, and we wrote a paper called Complexity and Randomness in the Heisenberg Groups. Um, and uh, more than anything, I hope people will look at the random graph paper. And um, this story, uh, uh, about about uh, constraint satisfaction. Uh, another place to look is uh, Don Knuth um, is just doing volume 4C and he's got a long story on constraint satisfaction um, and it's on his webpage he's, and he writes beautifully and he tries to motivate this problem of finding one induced subgraph in another and much better way than I can. Um, and uh, and there's, there's lots of lots of math to do. That's my effort at One World, and thank you for being there, and thank you for running it, and, and thanks. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. So uh, a round of applause, maybe. <laughs> Good. Can't stop myself. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Gesina. <laughs> Hi. And um, maybe a, a round of questions. Uh, okay. So does anyone want to 
to start uh, hostilities. <laughs> no, to, to, yeah, please, uh, Takis. Hi, thanks for the talk, Percy. I was just wondering about two things. First, you said you want to run a random walk in order to understand some things about the uh, Rado graph. So what are the things we understand? This, and we understand the convergence of the random walk, but what do we understand about the graph itself? Uh -huh. I didn't get that. Well, so so what one understands is the 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 neighborhood. If you label the, the neighborhoods, um, you'll see that more clearly when Laurent uses some of the insights that I started doing. But if you label the vertices of the graph one, two, three, um, the a, a, a vertex has a uh, a neighbor which is um, uh, 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 the, smallest the smallest neighbor of a vertex is around log of the label of the vertex. That, that's what right. came out. I mean, so it, it's just, you know, this is this program of, um, of uh, can you hear the shape of a drum? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. That. So it's just, it's just a standard way of, for a probabilist to get started meeting a new object. And right. I just took you through my efforts. And you'll see more. I think there'll be much more in Laurent's, Laurent's talk. Probabilists um, have taught analysts to run a, a brown on motion on a manifold to understand the Laplacian, I guess, on the yeah. manifold kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, and my second question was, if you change the distribution of the random walk in a way that it has a heavy tail or a faster tail, you get different things, I suppose, with this. Uh, so, of course, that's a wonderful natural question. <laughs> the lower bound doesn't change, um, ah. and 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 we it's still log star. Uh, that the argument I gave is very very robust. I just I wanted to get on with it and do it. So making a choice, it doesn't change. It's still log star. It's one over j squared. You know, it's still log star. I mean, you maybe you know, if you want to fuss around and make it really, really long tail, you could do something. But one over j squared, it was still log star. The upper bound, which Laurent will talk about, we don't know so much, and we're working on it. Um, and uh, and of course, it's 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 you know, this is a very short tail distribution, and we got started by saying let's take, you know, let's take instead of one over two, let's take eta to the minus j, where eta is very, very close to one. So that's sort of something like going to the uniform distribution, but we, we don't know. And uh, the, the, math is, the math is interesting. It's also worth saying that the whole subject of um, random walk on graphs, which are not locally finite, is more or less open. Uh, the only paper I was able to find uh, about it, and I'm sure I'll hear more and happy to hear more, was um, Bendikoff and Laurent Salofkost, uh did some did some work on um, random walk on groups which are not finitely generated on the Cayley graphs of groups. But there was I found one paper. I mean, which mm. which studied that. Now, of course, we run Markov chains on very general spaces. But you know, somehow, if you read any paper about random walk on graphs, it says, well, let G be a locally finite graph. Well, this one isn't, you know, yeah. and, and what happens? So this gave me a little bit of insight into what kinds of strange things can, can happen. Yeah. And by the way, I did not cheat. I have not seen your paper. I saw I did not know the log star there. So it was just a coincidence. Uh, You're an expert on coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Great. So I, I see in the chat that there is a, a question from uh, Steve Goldstein, so I, I may read it. Uh, is there a role for character theory or representation theory in this work? Ah, uh, is there a role for character theory? Not that I know of, because I, I, so far, the Rado, I love character and representation theory. And um, uh, let me let me let me answer that uh, this way. Um, Suppose I take the simplest group, uh, which is going to be infinite, namely the two element group to the infinity, just infinite binary sequences, our friend, right? And I'm going to make a random walk on that group by putting P1, P2, P3 up to P infinity, a probability distribution, uh, positive every place, just the way I had, and then pick a coordinate with probability PI 
and, um, and uh, change it to its opposite. So that would be a random walk on the infinite hypercube, right? It has a sort of similar flavor. And of course, anything like that, that you won't have a stationary distribution. It, the question is what choice of P makes you recurrent or transient. Um, and uh, I think we don't know so well, uh, but if you choose the P I chose, one over two to the J, um, <laughs> there's a beautiful theorem of uh, Keston and Spitzer, uh, which is a necessary and sufficient condition in terms of the representation theory for abelian groups. Um, uh, and uh, it, it, it is, it, it is recurrent, uh, I think, but, uh, but I think if, if, if and if it's, if it's shorter tailed, it isn't, but I think if it's longer tailed, we don't know so much. And um, uh, so you could make vaguely related problems, but the R doesn't have a, doesn't have a group structure and I, God, I don't know how to, yet, I don't know how to diagonalize it. It's such a nice, Markov chain, maybe it's not so bad to write down some, some things about eigenvectors because it's a reversible Markov chain on a countable set. So it has eigenvectors, you know, has a nice spectrum um, uh, for, it has a spectral gap. I shouldn't say that because Laurent is gonna say it, but, uh, um, but there's m m more to say, but, but I, don't, I don't know more about, the, about representation theory. But the, the question about trying to do random walks on, on non-finitely generated groups, I think that that's an interesting problem. I don't know about motivation, but... <laughs> uh, Great. Um, are there other questions? So, ah, okay, so, uh, so Charles, for example. Is that Charles Bordenov? Uh, yep. So we can't hear you. Uh, I saw Charles raising hand. Ah, yes. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, uh, we can. Okay. I agree with my. Okay. Uh, I will do it quickly. Uh, what, can you make your choice of um, of random? You could have a conductance model, for example, or. I didn't, I can't, I, I didn't say it again. Okay. I, or write it down in the chat maybe because yeah, your sound is very... Oh, yeah. So the uh, the question. Uh, so we think. Well, first of all, P is half. Of course, is special. Um, it felt to us as if the argument would go through, but we really haven't done it. It's more complicated. Um, the 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 finite parts that we I did with um, with uh, with uh, Shorov. Um, you, you one really would like to. You know, the the applied scientists want to know about P one and P two. We could do that, except it's it's hard work. Um, we thought the arguments would go through. You know, they have pictures of these boundaries, and we must be able to explain them. But I haven't done the work. Um, it did look substantially more complicated. But I hope one of you would do the work, and then I wouldn't have to. <laughs> uh, uh, so, but I don't know when uh, for the infinite radograph. That that's a thing I should have said at the beginning. <laughs> In the radograph. It doesn't, P doesn't matter. If you flip the coins, if you make the infinite radograph with any P, it's still the same radograph because property star holds with probability one and, uh, and that's it. So they're all isomorphic. So for the first half of the talk, P doesn't matter. But for the second half of the talk, there's work to do. <laughs> So then, so this was the question of, uh, I don't know how to pronounce correctly, Jezin Reinhardt, maybe? And, ah, sorry. Uh, and sure. now the, and the, so ah. great to answer this one. And now comes the one of Charles. Uh, yeah. So can you motivate the choice of the random walk? Why not a usual yeah. condu conductance model? Uh -huh. So, uh, well, I, first of all, okay, let me motivate the choice of the random walk because uh, it's, a, it's a cute little story. Um, uh, 
Um, so friends of all of ours, um, Gilles Lebeau and uh, Laurent Michel, were trying to do a, um, we're trying to invent a Markov chain for sampling on Ramanian, compact Ramanian manifolds from the uniform distribution on a compact Ramanian manifold. And they proposed and wrote a paper about a ball walk, which is if you're at X, look at the points that are you know, within a fixed radius of you and pick one of those with uniform probability. And, um, uh, and they showed me the paper and I said, <laughs> It's a nice, you know, 30 pages of hard estimates, but everything is wrong. Um, uh, that is, your walk doesn't have the uniform stationary distribution. And it seems so symmetrical and nice to them. You know, you're sampling from the uniform distribution in a neighborhood. What could be wrong? And I just couldn't convince them. And finally, I said, well, look, take a graph, and but not not a regular graph, take a graph and make your random walk from a vertex, pick one of the neighbors with equal probability and go there uniformly, and then just do that walk. Well, it's a reversible Markov chain, but the stationary distribution is proportional to the size of the neighborhood. And so that was how I first met ball walks. And um, there's no, nothing magical about that at all. It's just a way to get started. Um, I, I, Yuval Perez said, you could think about it this way. You just put the, um, you, you, you have a, a graph, you have a probability on the vertex set, you assign a, the weight of the edge uh, to be the product of the two weights on the, of the two vertices. And then you do the, usual, uh, you know, it's a reversible Markov chain. You could use the sum too, and you could do other things. It just was to get started. And really, I wasn't, I wasn't taking it terribly seriously. I wanted to use it as an excuse to hack around on the graph. And it certainly <laughs> did give me a, a, a reasonable feeling. You'll hear more about that in, in Laurent's talk. I hope that that helps. Uh, any other walk, you're welcome to it, that, you know, and I'll listen. You know, that's what I have to say. Uh, okay. Great, thank you. So, uh, yeah, since uh, maybe it will soon be time for Laurent uh, to start, maybe we will stop uh, this question session. I just wanted maybe to make uh, just one comment around uh, something you, you said. Uh, you mentioned that uh, it would be nice to study more uh, random work beyond the locally finite setting. Uh, so me, I'm more from the percolation side of probability. And I wanted to mention there is some work by Georgia Kopoulos and Assel Grave who, who does percolation beyond locally finite. And indeed, in percolation theory as well, there is just uh, very little works being done uh, beyond locally finite. So I just wanted uh, to uh, advertise uh, this side of the coin as well. <laughs> um, Can you say their names again? Can you say uh, yeah, names? so uh, Jorga Kopoulos on the Assel Grave. Uh, okay. I, yeah, uh, right. I should write it down in, in the chat maybe. Um, okay, so thank you again very much for this talk and all these uh, answers and questions. So maybe a second round of applause. <laughs> And um, okay, so we have a one minute, one minute and a half break, <laughs> and then uh, at uh, at three p.m. UTC, we resume with a uh, Lawrence talk uh, this time, uh, and maybe we can break the.